you know, some people find nature beautiful, some people find art beautiful, but we know that November, in fact, is the most beautiful thing, which is why my kids, they don't even go to school anymore. I just lock them up in the basement and tell them, you know what? You can come out once you do all 30 days of November and they are gonna be better for it. Anyways, <laughs> we're on day two of November. You can see the prompt for today's candy. Uh, so we're going to have food for the next five days. Yummy, yummy. And uh, for this one, I did kind of the same thing that a lot of people are doing, but I did it with a bit of a twist of making a lollipop, but instead of starting with a sphere, which would be the easy option, this is kind of like that. Oh, I can do November, but really I don't have any talent at all. I decided, you know what, let's start with the cube, something that isn't very lollipop-like and do that transformation. It has color control, pull control, it's actually transmissive, so we're going to be mixing BSDFs, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this, <laughs> this would be a good project to do. So let me show you the blend file. Again, these are going to be available on Patreon because, um, wow, that, that's a hard sentence to say, uh, because I'm not going to be doing like literally step by step to get this exact animation right here. I'm going to show you how to make the lollipop with vector displacement and a couple new tricks that weren't in the last November video. But if you want a shot for shot copy, it's going to be on Patreon. Um, so just like last time, what I've done is I've taken a bunch of nonsense. Look at all these nodes. Dare I say it, <laughs> too many nodes. I've taken all of them and compressed them into a node group with only four sliders that let you control pretty much every aspect of the Solly Pop that I deemed important. So first of all, and you can see this animation that I'm doing here is a product of keyframing these. Uh, first of all, we have the transform, which is kind of like the vector displacement and mix BSDF slider, uh, which is what converts this between a cube and a lollipop, right? This is the how much of a lollipop slider is it? You know, uh, I took this cube and sent it over to, what's that name of the company, 23andMe, and said, do a genetic testing. I think this thing is like at least 50% lollipop, and it came back positive. We also have the color of the lollipop. This is just hue shifting, but it's very effective to get different, different flavors. This is kind of like the Windex flavor. Love it. <laughs> we also have the uh, stick height. That is the height of this lollipop stick, which looks a bit weird right now, but that's just because it needs more subdivisions in the viewport and the render. It's not going to look like uh, that. And then we have thickness, uh, which is, I, I mean, imagine putting a lolly. This is looking like a uh, pacifier now. It's quite a different thing. But we are going to do all these sliders and make all this math. And hopefully by the end of this, you too can suck. Get it? Lollipop can suck at a blender november as well so let's start off with a new project and i know uh, that in the last tutorial i said oh we will we'll make a setup file and we'll use it every single time and i'm still for that uh, but at least for the first two tutorials let me just show you how to set this up for people that are onboarding on november by the way hello uh <laughs> welcome to the best november series ever um for people onboarding here's how i like to set this up First things first is we go to rendered mode and say we're going to be doing displacement and stuff like this and Eevee can't handle that kind of stuff. So let's switch over to cycles with GPU because god damn my computer with its new 2070 super it can blast through this kind of stuff. We're also going to enable film transparent and this is just to make the background transparent since we're going to be adding an HDRI and then we can move over to once we delete the light we can move over to the shading workspace, which is where we add in the HDRI. Where do I get HDRIs from, you ask, with a little drool coming from the corner of your mouth begging for the answer. The answer is HDRI Haven. It's a website where you can get free HDRIs, and then you get a realistic lighting uh, that is all image-based. Again, if you don't know what's going on, let me disable transparent. We've imported this HDRI, and it's basically lighting our cube without actually needing uh, real lights. Final thing we're going to need for this... Uh, whole setup is again we want to transform this into a sphere it's going to need a lot of vector displacement so we're going to need much more geometry than just eight vertices control three for a subdivision level of uh, three <laughs> subdivision surface modifier of level three last time we think we used two to get uh, going so this is a level up uh, you're seeing already wow i've done the thing of making it a sphere this is cheating make sure this is set to simple yes subdivision will turn it into a rounded cube uh, but we want to do that with vector displacement. Speaking of which, again, make sure this is simple or I'm going to accuse you. The principal's office is what you're going to be sent to. You're going to be accused of cheating. Uh, since we are using displacement, make sure that in the settings that displacement is set to one of these two settings so that there's actually geometry-based displacement. And uh, today we are actually going to be using displacement only instead of displacement and bump. And I'll show you why in a second. So we'll pick the bad option and you'll see the issue. So this is our startup file. Congratulations, you made it. <laughs> We've done it. And this is gonna be our tutorial 
version of the lollipop. Okay, so we have set up everything and we're good to go. So first order of business is we have our subdivided cube. I want it to be a lollipop and the the sucker, the uh, candy part of the lollipop needs to be a sphere. So here's how you do it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna be doing shift A, not shift S, common mistake for the rookies. We're gonna be using vector displacement. And, you're, and you might be thinking, oh, how do we do this kind of conversion? We need the exact mathematical formula for a sphere. And in some sense we do, but it's really not that complicated. A sphere is basically just this like round object, right? Welcome, <laughs> welcome to kindergarten. It's this round object where all the points on the sphere are equidistant from the center. In other words, the vectors that compose, uh, compose <laughs> that compose the sphere um, are all of the same length. So we can take that idea and formalize it mathematically. So we have the position vectors x, y, z for every point on the cube. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to analyze, analyze what, so I'm not sending this to the uh, chiropractor isn't the word. I'm not sending this to the mortician. And I feel like these aren't <laughs> the words I'm trying to say. I feel like the true viewers know the jokes I'm going for. I don't need to say them anymore. Uh, what we want to do is analyze the length of the vectors. This outputs the length of every x, y, z vector on the cube uh, because we want to make these all the same length. So, of course, we want to see what they are. I'm also going to add in a scale vector math. And what we want to do is scale the position. In other words, we want to scale the cube by not really just the length of this because that's just going to give us something that doesn't work. Let me just show you what it gives us. Make sure this is an object space. It gives us kind of like a inverse transform of what we want. And if we set the scale to a negative number, which I don't know if it lets us. Um, either way, <laughs> point is it gives us the inverse transform where stuff's kind of pushing away instead of pushing inwards. We want these corners to be compressing inwards. Uh, what we want to do is we want to take this length and scale it by math, division, and the reciprocal. The reciprocal. What does this gives us, give us? It gives us a perfect sphere once we subtract away. And I swear this will all make sense in a second. You're like, wow, you're going through so much at once. It will make sense. Uh, what we have right now is a transformation that gives us a sphere. And the question is why, <laughs> why is this sequence of nodes exactly that, okay? So what we did is we took the position vectors of the cube. Again, you kind of want to imagine there's no vector displacement here. So position of the cube. Uh, we took this and we outputted the lengths of every single point on the cube. And we said we know that a sphere is basically this object with constant length everywhere. Meaning if we take the cube lengths and do the reciprocal, uh, long story short, we're going to be normalizing them. We are going to be transforming them to all be the same value. Okay? So we're scaling. We're scaling by the inverse of the lengths, which uh, basically normalizes it, right? If you take five and divide it by five or multiply it by the reciprocal, which is a fifth, uh, it turns into one is the idea. Okay, so we've scaled it and then we did the subtraction because right now this describes our transformation. It does, uh, but we want to get rid of the original vector. So we want to transform and have those be the final coordinates without the initial cube coordinates. So we subtracted away uh, the position. And what does that give us? Drum roll, drum roll. <laughs> Let me do it. Drum roll. Uh, what it gives us is a perfect sphere. Now, one thing you're probably noticing is there's some shading issues and that's kind of an artifact of this being a cube. You can see there's like uh, six sides to this and there's almost in some sense, the original six sides here just projected down in this method. And I was in distress the other day. I'm like, I wanna make this tutorial. I know how to do it, but I don't know how to fix this shading issue. Do I need to rewrite the normals? And I asked Gabe and Gabe, in his angelic grace, flew down to me and handed me the biggest handout of all time, which was basically setting this to displacement only is what he said. And you can see that actually fixed the issue, even when we do a shade smooth and all that. So uh, basically a lot of shading issues are a result of this bump mapping that we actually do not want. And to celebrate Gabe's angelic thing, go check out his channel and let me drink a bit of water. Uh, nothing like refreshing water break in the middle of the tutorial. Okay, so now we have the transformation uh, that does what? It takes us from a cube, which again is looking a bit weird, and that's just because of the shade smooth. Uh, you could even do an angle kind of situation here, by the way, if you want to do a, where is it, a normal, this thing, which will keep our sharp edges if it meets this threshold. So this is a 90 degree angle, which is bigger than 30, so it's not shade smooth. Uh, but... Uh, when we scale this up, it will shade smooth everything. So now we have the basic setup. I'm just going to add a bit of a subdivision. And the next step, and this is kind of the key part of the tutorial. This is the idea that I didn't introduce last time. That's going to be very important uh, going forwards, 
is how do we take a transformation like this one, right? So we have one transformation, and how do we overlay another transformation? So not like not like doing two steps separately, but how do we do one after another? So what we want is this center ring along the sphere to be expanded out a bit uh, like a lollipop. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. So here you can see the sphere with this kind of ring extended outwards, kind of like the rings of Saturn, but you can suck on that. <laughs> That's the main difference. Um, how do we add two transformations one after another with only using one vector displacement? Because you can't really chain these together in a way that makes sense. So somehow we need to bake all the instructions in here even before it reaches the vector displacement, okay? Um, so that's the name of the game. So first of all, let me do kind of the naive approach, what you might expect uh, to do to add in this ring, and I'll show you what the issue with that is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to separate by X, Y, and Z components because three branches are stronger than one when you, you know, try to break them. Either, <laughs> either way, uh, we only care about the Z components since we want to make a ring depending on the height of this. I'm going to use a bit of a trick that was added in 2.82, uh, which is the compare node or the compare function in the math node, which lets us, if we set this to zero, quickly create a mask of the area that it is that we want to expand. What's happening here is we're taking the height, the z coordinate, and comparing it to zero ground level and saying if it's within the distance or really the radius of 0.27, make it white. So smaller radius is less, bigger radius is more, and this is going to be shifting what it is we're comparing. Okay? So what we want to do, at least in theory, is we want to add in, so this is the next transformation, we want to add in the position vectors that we are going to, and I know it's looking crazy right now, but we're going to fix it, uh, that we are going to scale. Where's scale? We are going to scale not everywhere, but only where this is white. So we're going to scale it like this, okay? And you might be thinking this is essentially what we want because, and let's just view it, what it's doing is it's taking our sphere wherever it was black, like the top and, huh, that's a strong burp there, uh, like the top and bottom hemispheres. It's taking that and saying scale it by zero and then add it so nothing happens. And then in the center, it's going to scale it and then add it. So <laughs> long story short, in the middle, it's going to be adding a bit of something, something. And you might be thinking this is what we want. We've now added two transformations. Although, if you think about it mathematically and you think about it very closely, you, you see how this is kind of like a rounded square. And we can make that more obvious if we do a bit of multiplication so we can control the strength of this. You see this kind of gives a rounded square, whereas when you think about it, just adding scaled position vectors should go out radially in a circle. Why? Why is this giving us part of a square? And the answer is a bit kind of nuanced and complex and really, really what's going on here is the issue is that we do not want to be inputting in our position vectors and then doing stuff and then adding it in the next step. So again, originally, originally what we had is just this going into our vector displacement. This is what made it a sphere. And then we decided, okay, we're going to add in a second transformation that has a bunch of math behind it. The thing is, this transformation is dependent, dependent on the sphere happening first, right? So first we expect this cube to be a sphere, then we do that scaling. However, uh, these position vectors are kind of unrelated to that. So we need an order of operations because right now it's kind of doing both of these simultaneously. To add in an order of operations, we said we did all this work just to create the sphere. So we output it here. So what I'm going to do is before we even do all this math over here with the separating and all, and all that, we're going to take our position and add in. We are going to include the transformation from before. But you're seeing that this isn't actually solving the issue. It might have done a slight modification. So here's without the adding and then with, you know, with adding, if anything, it only made it a bit worse. Now we have this kind of banding issue that's going on. But you see, and you, you probably see it now, especially when we increase it again, this is still a square transformation. And you might be thinking, yo, what gives? I, I deserve, I'm entitled uh, to this whole kind of situation working. You might be thinking, okay, we've now updated updated our position coordinates with the addition of the transformation. Why is this not working? Okay. Well, the issue is, and you, you might be already noticing this, we again use the position coordinates as what we are adding to scale in. In other words, we kind of <laughs> kind of introduced this idea and then didn't use it all the way through. Okay, so instead of this, what we want to do, and this will make sense in a second, instead of this, what we want to do is add in the scaled position vectors that includes that includes the transformation. When we do this, it now gives a perfect circle. Yeah, we did it. So again, long story short, you want to think about an order of operations. We start from this position coordinates. We then do this whole transformation, which if this is all that we see, this is what gives us the sphere, okay? 
Once we get to this point, we now say, okay, now we want step two, the next transformation. So we go back, add the position vector to this transformation, and then do the rest of this math where everything from this point on has to include the transformation, including uh, the added uh, scale vector. So let's put that in there. So now we get a perfectly circular thing that makes sense. And again, we're gonna be doing a step three where we're gonna have a pole jutting out of here. So we're gonna have to repeat this process again and again and again and again and again. It's like living through Beetlejuice. Although maybe I was thinking about summoning Beetlejuice in this tutorial. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Be oh, not doing it. <laughs> okay, so what, what else can, can we do to make this look like not actual fucking garbage, right? Uh, well, first thing we can do is make this less intense. So again, we added this multiplication where we have this mask and we're saying, what is gonna be the strength of that mask? And that's what the multiplication does. So uh, let's take this and just bring it in till it's much closer to this. And then we want to give it a bit of rounding or at least pinch this kind of saucer thing that we've extruded out of here. To do that, what we can do is before we even do, or actually, I guess, after we add the scaled vector, but before we actually add them to our original setup, so when we include the scale vector, but don't add them yet, what we can do is in between, we can multiply component-wise. So let's multiply, one, one, one gives us the original. We can take the Z component and just make it less intense, which will pinch the added vectors is a good way to think about it, okay? And this will effectively give, it, give us a bit of rounding, especially when we add in more divisions. And again, when you render this, you are going to add in way more divisions than we have here, but this is just kind of like the initial setup. So you get, again, you can tweak values whenever you want because this is all procedural. And now what do we have? We have a cube transforming into this. So now the next and final step really when it comes to vector displacement and really isn't looking too complicated. I know there's quite a bit of vector math, but you're a big boy, you can handle it. You're going through vector math puberty. There's nothing to be scared of, it happens to everybody. Sometimes your voice drops and sometimes <laughs> you connect the wrong node. The next thing we wanna do, again, I'll show you the wrong workflow and then say what you should have done. We are going to separate the position vector by X, Y, and Z components and we wanna say take the bottom part and extrude it downwards. So we need to isolate the bottom part. To do this, I'm gonna use a math and I think it should be less than, not greater than. So we isolate the bottom being white. We take this threshold and just make it smaller until, and let's view the bottom, until we have a tiny, tiny circle, something like that, maybe 0.99. So again, if we did greater than, it would isolate everything else we want less than. Uh, you might be thinking, okay, we take this and then what, what do you do? Before we reach vector displacement, we add in the vector. In other words, we include another transformation and what we wanna do is just um, kind of extrude uh, this section down along the z-axis. So we want control of every component and we say, okay, take this mask, move it on the z-axis, but where, um, you know, <laughs> in this uh, masked area, I don't know what that sentence even meant. And we're gonna multiply it by a negative value so that it actually juts outwards instead of forwards. And you do that and you see, wow, it's not looking good. And again, the reason is, and remember, this is kind of the key idea here. Uh, when we went to this third branch of vector displacement, again, we use the initial position vectors. We don't wanna do that. We want to add in all the steps that came before that. So again, we added this in. So really, uh, we stopped here before. You take this, you add it in, and then it corrects it, okay? Because now we've evaluated steps one and two, and now we are on to step three. So now we can make this any length we want. So now we actually have the slider. Uh, for the length of this, and maybe it's a time, maybe it's time to start adding in some sliders that we can control later. So this can be our length slider that we can uh, move over into the corner. We can also have a slider for the, what is this? This should be the uh, thickness of it. Again, this is the mask of the, um, the bottom of the sphere. Again, so we can increase that and it gets bigger and decrease it to make it smaller, but you don't wanna make it too small or it disappears. And then, you know, we, we could add a couple more things, but for now, that's pretty good. Okay, so now we have kind of the, the shape of a, you know, of the thing, of a lollipop. And really, the rest of what makes it look like a lollipop is the easy part, actually. It's just the BSDF nonsense. And we can actually use some tricks from before to get some masks to say, okay, we want one material for the top, one for the bottom, etc. Before we get into that, I'm just going to make this a bit thinner. So it looks a bit more like a lollipop. And now, let's continue. Okay, so... How do we make this look like a lollipop? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in two BSDFs. Again, one is gonna be for the candy and one is gonna be for the stick. And what we are gonna do is control shift, right click, drag. Again, <laughs> control shift, right click, drag. This is like this is like when you're like, how do I, how do I not crash? How do I land this plane? They're like, easy, 
Just sit upside down, put, put a thumb in your butt, <laughs> pull the lever. a lot of instructions. We wanna mix these two together, where let's say one is gonna be red, just so we can distinguish them, and one's gonna be white, uh, but we want the mixing factor to be positionally dependent. And you might be thinking, okay, we do the same thing that we did in the cookie tutorial from November day one, and you look at generated coordinates and we say, okay, we wanna separate the Z component by the area that's on the bottom and whatever. Now remember, and this is gonna be the issue, remember, while it is a good thing, it's also gonna harm us that our generated coordinates, that, you know, this is the generated coordinates for the cube, they actually transform, they transform uh, with our vector displacement, which is why this looks so weird, right? Um, so, because this transforms, the issue is that the bottom of this pole basically only has a single coordinate value because of the math we did before. We just took a section and just added a vector to extrude it downwards. In other words, and let me just show you what this means. In other words, if we separate by X, Y, Z, and we wanna separate the Z component already, you see that just like the black uh, area where it should be very close to zero is also taking up this area. And we could try to isolate it just a tiny bit better. So we see where it's greater than, and we bring this down and we get close to zero, it includes this part and there's some artifacting for the reason we just talked about, okay? Um, this is not gonna be the way to do it to create the mask. In fact, we're gonna do the same thing from before using position vectors because that's just the X, Y, Z coordinates post transformation of every point here. So it should be super easy to isolate it. And we're gonna have to talk about an issue that this um, introduces, but we'll get there in a second. So. What I'm gonna do is same idea, but instead of texture coordinates, we're gonna use position. Uh, this should be negative one, since it is the bottom of the original cube. And now we've isolated top from bottom, use this as the mixing factor, bada bing, bada boom, uh, you've isolated top from bottom. Now one issue this introduces, and this is kind of the thing I was kind of, you know, poking at before, kind of teasing you, is because this depends on the location, the location of the object, if I was to move the original cube, uh, you can see it's not working out too good, right? The the good thing about texture coordinates is they stick with it, so it doesn't matter where we move it, but with position, it doesn't work, right? So <laughs> what kind of complicated math could we do to fix this? And you, you might think about it, and like long story short, if we were somehow to take this position kind of vector or coordinate system and somehow adjust it by the location of this, maybe using drivers, using this XYZ stuff, well, that would work perfectly. And you might be thinking, oh, that's a lot of work, but but there's this node that everybody forgets about. It's called the object info node, and it takes our object, in this case, the cube, and what it actually does is it has a location uh, vector. And this is not like X, Y, Z locations of every point on this node. This is just the location of the origin, the object itself. So if we do some vector math, and then we take this and subtract away the same way that we kind of included transformations from before, but this, time's, this time it's subtraction, uh, we subtract away the location of this, now uh, it actually moves with it. Again, if this is over here, initially we would have a bit of an issue, right? But what we do is we subtract away, we say move it in some sense, at least metaphorically, mathematically, move it to the origin. That's what the subtraction does. And then apply the, the, um, the whole mixing factor thing, then it's going to work. And you will go through actually similar issues when it comes to rotation and scaling. And I think, I think uh, like long story short, I'm not gonna go through all that. The, the solution is instead of doing the subtraction for the rotation issue, you add in a vector rotate node and use drivers and stuff like that. And for the scaling, instead of a subtraction, you do a scaling by the reciprocal of the um, scale, or you could do it component by component by component. Um, that's how you solve it, but uh, for this, we're just gonna say that this is good enough. Also, something I forgot to mention that I guess you should do, I don't think it's gonna make that much of an impact, but in case it does create some glitches later, we have done this position kind of correction, again, using the location thing, which does work. However, however, we wanna make sure that just in case, and I need to think about the logic of this, uh, just in case that would mess up some stuff back here, especially when we add rotation and scale and all this, why not just take the position thing from before and then just subst you know, substitute in our correction thing. It doesn't really change anything. However, if we were to add some more complicated stuff to this, including the rotation, the scale, it might, be, you know, it might be something worth considering. So again, where were we? Now we have this kind of mixing factor, right? That is determined by the position that is corrected for, uh, because again, originally this would not have worked and it has this issue. 
uh, we corrected for it, and now the name of the game is how do we actually make this look like a good-looking lollipop? Well, <laughs> a good start would be make, making it not just red, but something that you might want to eat to... Wow. Wow, words are hard. Something that you might want to eat. Like right now, this is looking like maybe something you'd play kickball with, <laughs> not necessarily something you'd eat. So let's use noise texture. This is just going to add in a bit of variation. And right now it's using generated coordinates, which really there's nothing wrong with it. However, however, and you know it's using generated coordinates by just doing this, but it doesn't actually show that it's using generated coordinates, believe me. Um, however, again, remember that the texture coordinates are stretched, which really isn't an issue for this part. And luckily we don't need the bottom part since that is stretched the most. However, However, uh, if you do not want this, just so you know that this is possible, you can use the corrected position vector as the um, thing for this as well. However, we'll experiment with generated and see what that gives us, okay? So we're gonna take this, we're gonna use it as the base color, and just to make it look more lollipoppy, I'm gonna add a bit of detail, a bit of swirl, and this is the important part, distortion. So this is just gonna make it swirl a bit and make it look more candy-like. And we can also play with the scale in a bit, but, but let's play with a bit of color here. So I'm going to add in a color ramp node. This is just going to affect the black and white uh, that we're inputting in here. So I'm just going to first add a bit of contrast just so you can see the swirls. And you can see this is where the stretching happens the most again because generated coordinates are being used here. So I'm just going to actually switch to this now. So now you see we have a nice even uh, coordinate system uh, that works here. Uh, so now we have high contrast swirls. We can make it less... Uh, prominent by moving the scale of the noise, something like two and a half. And let's make these, you know, delicious looking colors. So one of them could be red. Another one could be like a color close to red, like some kind of purple or something like that. Whatever looks kind of tasty, we'll make that brighter. And let's play around with the contrast again. This is really the artistic part <laughs> that I'm not really too good at, but whatever. Um, what makes it look like a lollipop is that along with the transmission, which is what makes it transparent. So now it's kind of see-through and it has kind of a lollipoppy quality. And now we can see that the reds or the purple, the whatever, <laughs> this color isn't really peeking through. So we can just increase that and move this until we get what we want. A good amount to swirl between both of these. There we go. And another thing you can do that I guess isn't really too realistic, but I do like the look of it, is we can add in a bit of bump mapping. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Displacement only. Uh, from what I understand, this doesn't mean <laughs> what I think it means. You can still use normal uh, bump mapping as long as you use a bump node. It's just not going to work with displacement. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this same noise so that it matches with our color swirls. I'm going to use this and use it as a height factor which will give us kind of a nice lolly poppy kind of like Mars surface kind of thing going on here. Uh, just make it less intense, 0.2. This will just make it really look candy-like. So here's without and here's with. It really is good with some texture, maybe 0.1, so it's less intense. And again, I'm not liking the color distribution we have going on here. It's not very evident that there's two colors going on. I guess it's because it's the wrong color that I thought was taken over. So let's just use two opposite colors so we can see what's going on. And then finally, let's move this so it's like a nice color related to red, like orange or purple or something. And by the way, just a quick way to change colors while keeping this color ramp situation without doing too much work, hue saturation node, plug this in, and then you just mess with the hue to get different flavors very quickly. And what you can do is make this another one of our sliders. So value node for the hue, not for the factor, but the hue. Connect this uh, right here. And now we have, what do we have? We have the height, I believe. Yeah, the height of the uh, pole, <laughs> the pole, the thing that you hold the lollipop by, the handle. <laughs> I can eat my lollipop with no handlebars. Uh, we also have the thickness, and then we finally have the hue. And then and then I guess we also have access to the final thing uh, which from the original, which is the transformation. And this looks really cool going from a cube to a lollipop. Um, okay, so now we have that. Another thing that will make it look lollipoppy is it's supposed to be shiny. Not too shiny, but just fairly shiny. This is what makes it look like saccharin and sweet. Um, so maybe something like a 0.2 or a 0.25. You can even add in clear coat uh, to make it even shinier. Uh, but for me, I think this is going to be good enough. And then I'm thinking that the lollipop should be a bit longer. Let's do negative 4.5 just so it goes a bit further. The next thing that we should probably do is make the handle not just look a bit boring, but just add a tiny bit of detail. Uh, to do this, what I'm going to do is add in another noise texture again. Every time you add a noise, it's just going to make the render a bit slower, or at least the computation of this node tree slower. So do it sparingly. 
uh, but for this I do think it would be useful and necessary. So noise texture, I want to make this one have no distortion, but very, very fine detail. So something like 100. So we just get these very tiny black and white dots. And I think you can probably already guess what I'm going to do here. One, I'm going to use this as the base color, so it's not completely white, uh, but it has a bit of detail. And second of all, just like before, I'm going to use bump mapping, so it just has a tiny bit of texture. So connect this to the normal socket, use this as the height factor, and now it's kind of looking very grungy, a little too concrete -y. So just make it less intense. And what we can do, uh, just for the colors, we could do a bit of math addition, uh, which will make it brighter. So something like 0.3, just to make it a bit brighter. We could even go brighter than that if we want. But there you go. I think long story short, that's the essence of this. I'm trying to think if there's anything I've left out other than like the rotation and scaling. I think I'll do that as a Patreon tutorial just for them being so noble. By the way, again, <laughs> one file on Patreon. Uh, now we have this lollipop that moves around with the system. Everything's kind of dependent on this position, coordinates um, that are corrected for with object info. And the takeaway from this tutorial, again, was in the vector displacement. It was this idea of every time we go step by step by step, we have to go backwards and add in, add in to our position situation, if I can find it. Yeah, from here. Uh, what we've done is we added in the transformation from before. So we have step one, step two, step three. And what do we have to show for it? We have a lollipop with color. Wow, that looks so good. I, that actually looks tasty. Uh, that has this kind of situation, that has control over various stuff. And yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this tutorial. I think that's all I have to say for this one. This is the node network. You could always like move everything down, control G to make it just a, a node group. And then you have control over of these sliders without any of the mess. But anyways, if you enjoyed this tutorial and you want to become, <laughs> wow, I feel like that's not the way to start. But either way, um, I have a Patreon. It exists. It's a good place to get the project files for stuff like this. So I'm going to upload the original blend file, um, not like this one, but the one that actually has some care and blood and sweat and tears put into it. Um, that should be a bit nicer. You can play around with that one or you could follow the instructions for this one. Project files, behind the scenes content, Discord access, as long of, <laughs> along with um, exclusive tutorials that I post every once in a while that are not available for free on YouTube. Anyways, I want to thank the 500 some uh, patrons that are currently supporting both channels. This is the reason that I can do kind of like November tutorials that I know don't generate that many views and stuff like that, uh, but still be able to do it because I have that revenue stream from people that are supporting this channel that are also getting stuff in return. Anyways, Patreon exists. Check it out if you want to. But anyways, just your viewership of this tutorial just warms my heart. <laughs> Thank you for watching this. Now you know how to turn a... Wait, I want to access the original slider. Now you know how to turn a cube into a lollipop. Who would have thought that this would be necessary? That's all I got for you guys. See ya.